right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Fogartyville Community Media and Arts Center for our WSLR Benefit Show tonight. We had something of a folk revival here last night. You know, it was great with Jim Queskin and our local jug band. I know some of you were here for that. It was lots of fun. And now we're continuing with some good folk music tonight. And two of our favorite local performers, really. Uh, James Hawkins is a former WSLR programmer. He used to host the folk show on WSLR, and we miss him. So it's really good to have him here performing tonight. And then Bill Schustick is longtime favorite of ours, uh, performed for us many times at Fogartyville and Bradenton, and now they're our neighbors. So. Howdy. Howdy. How are you guys doing? This is going to be a lot of fun. You get a chance to, um, this is the culmination of a couple of years where the, where the research here. Listen very carefully, you might hear the sounds of the ones who came before us. Their spirits are all around. They can tell us a story and sing us a song. Come now, have a seat. It won't take too long. Well, there's Big Jake Summerlin and old Bonaparte Mazel. Take you through the swamps and sloughs on up to Taytel. On the back of Acrefoot, they opened up this land. Their stories linger on. Just listen to the wind. If I could turn back time, stand by their side. What they were thinking as it all went down. It would make me smile if I could turn back time. With the courage of Osceola, the sacrifice of Harry Moore, we can find the truth to find what life has in store. If we read what Marjorie wrote about that sea of grass, we can find a thread that links us to the past. If I could turn back time, stand by their side, know what they were thinking as it all went down. It would make me smile if I could turn back time. If I could turn back time. If I could turn back time. It would make me smile if I could turn back time. Thank you. Well, like I say, folks, um, every, I'm going to sing you some songs and tell you some stories and tales and things about Florida and about Venice and about Sarasota. And uh, it's a very interesting place. I've been down here about 25, maybe 30 years. And, and when I first came down here, I came down here just for the hang out on the beach and drink lots of beer and looking at the pretty girls, you know. But after I, I moved here and got a job, started looking around and there was a lot more underneath the surface. And that's true, it's just like an iceberg. There's, you could, stuff's on the top, but you look underneath, see amazing the amount of stuff you find. And all true, an all true story. Does anybody remember Muhammad Ali with the thrill in Manila? You know what I'm talking about? All right, in about, the, about 1890, early 1890s, there was a, um, uh, there was a fellow by the name of a gentleman, Jim Corbett, who had defeated John L. Sullivan in a bare knuckles championship fight in New York City. And I knocked him out in like the, I think it's like the sixth or seventh round. And he was, um, uh, gentleman Jim declared himself the world champion. 
And it was a fellow in, New, in, uh, in England, his name was Charlie Mitchell. He said, no, I don't think so. I think you and I need to go at it. And that's the truth. So they decided they'd look for a place to find, to, to, uh, to have this big fight. And they put their eyes on Jacksonville, Florida. And sure enough, Jacksonville, Florida at the time was a, was a, was a, 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 um, a seaport. It was basically a, a drinking village with a fishing problem. They, did, they didn't really care what went on and what happened as long as they got the next beer. So, But many of the streets were, were pretty much mud and, and sand. But when this happened, it turned everything upside down. It was one of the most pivotal, mo pivotal moments in that city's history to actually try to put it on the map. So this, is a, this song came from a, an actual someone who actually described what it was like living through this. There was drinking, there was swearing, there was even card playing, and Satan walked the streets of our town. There were ladies of the night, the man was quite a sight, the day Jim Corbett came to town. In the year 93, our town slept quietly, we had no idea what was about to go down. Promoters were looking for a place to have a prize fight. They put Jacksonville clearly in their sights. Now, gentleman Jim Corbett beat John L. the year before. And England's champ, Charlie Mitchell, he wanted a shot. Both fighters were in their prime. They'd drop a man at the turn of a dime. Both were ready and raring to go. There was drinking, there was swearing, there was even card playing, and Satan walked the streets of our town. There were ladies of the night, and man, it was quite a sight. The day Jim Corbett came to town. Now the Duval Athletic Club put up $20,000. They said, winner take all. Soon the population swelled. And then we asked ourselves if Jacksonville was really ready for it all. Now the Duval, the Duval County Sheriff, Napoleon Broward was his name. He said, this fight is not going to take place. Nope. Said, I'll jail and find them all. I'll drag their ass to City Hall. Corbin Mitchell, they came anyway. There was drinking, there was swearing, there was even card playing, and Satan walked the streets of our town. There were ladies of the night, and man, it was quite a sight, the day Jim Corbett came to town. Now, tempers flared, martial law was declared, and the Gate City Rifle Company had to come out and take charge. There were rakes and ramblers sportsmen and gamblers, they filled every saloon and bar. Now the governor tried, after that very day, to keep this all from coming to pass. Soon the call went out across the land, saying, boys, it's time to lay your money down. There was drinking, there was swearing, there was even card playing. Satan walked the streets of our town. There were ladies of the night, and man, it was quite a sight. The day Jim Corbett came to town. Well, after all the sleepless nights and the, the many court fights, Corbett and Mitchell, they finally squared off. Well, the first round was a draw, but in the second one, people saw Corbett knock Mitchell to the ground. Now the people all could tell that Mitchell was groggy as hell, but still he put up his gloves to fight. With the right to the contender's nose, he fell hard, don't you know? Hmm. That was the end of that fight. Oh, man. There was drinking, there was swearing, there was even card playing. Satan walked the streets of our town. There were ladies of the night. Man, it was quite a sight. 
the day Jim Corbett came to town. Yeah, the day Jim Corbett came to town. Yeah, the day Jim Corbett came to town. In 1847, there was a fellow by the name of Bill Whitaker came in. And I don't know if you guys are aware of Whitaker Bayou. You know where Whitaker Bayou is? Bill Whitaker left, left his home when he was 14 years of age in, in Georgia, hopped on a freighter, skidded the ocean, wound up down in Key West, eventually wound up in Tallahassee, and ran into his brother. His brother tried to talk him into going into school, and he went into school for a while, but I really wouldn't. Wouldn't, what he wanted to do, you know? And um, so he, uh, at the time, it was if you could work an acre of land for five years, then at the end of that five years, you would go back to Tallahassee or go to the county seat and say, look what I've done with this, and there's some affidavits and stuff, and then you can buy the adjoining acres of land or some other acres of land for about twenty five, which is pretty cheap you know, compared to nowadays, but but that's, that, was the, that was the deal. So they came down, they came down the coast, they pulled into the Manatee River, and they, some of the folks said, well, we're looking for places to, um, to uh, have a, to set up a homestead. And he said, well, you know, there's some places a little further south. You want to look at those. It's really beautiful. You can't miss it. It's got these big, huge ye uh, yellow clay bluffs. You know where Van Wazel is? If you go to Van Wazel and you stand there and you look out in the bay and you look directly to your right, and it's exactly what Bill Whitaker saw with those big, bright, yellow clay bluffs. And that was, that's how the place started. You know, he went up to the bayou and built a house. But and that's not what I'm actually trying, I'm going forward. And in 1883, this fellow by the name of John Tate was a, running around Edinburgh, Scotland. And he was uh, sending out these, these flyers about this great deal. This was a great deal. What it was, was that the middle class, if you were a middle class guy and you wanted to get your standing in life a lot better, what you would do was uh, you would give him a lot of money you know, and they would, uh, build a they would build a city. And all you had to do was uh, go with them, you build the money, uh, give them the money, they go across the, to, the, uh, to Florida, a place called Florida, and they were going to uh, build this place called the Ormstead Colony. And all you had to do was walk up and they give you a key, turn the key, and it's there. There's houses, churches, schools, the whole thing. Everything was there, according to them. <laughs> according to them. They hopped on a freighter and, and laid in, they hopped on a, on a ship laid in November, made it to New York City, New York City down to Fernandina Bay. Fernandina, they went right across the state wound up at a place called Cedar Key. When they got the Cedar Key, the things started getting weird. Now, they were asking about the Ormstead Colony. People go, what are you talking about? There's no Ormstead Colony. See, so, yeah, sure enough, they jumped on our steamer. They came, they came around those yellow bluffs. There was nothing here but a broken down general store, a temporary dock, and a bunch of building supplies sitting on the, sitting on the, sitting on the, on the shore. So they were off to America. That's what they were doing. They were told of a place so far away, far from Glasgow town. So they boarded a ship and they crossed that ocean, looking for a paradise found. And they were off to America. Was a land so far away, worth all of the money that they would have to pay just to find Sarasota Bay. So they left on Thanksgiving Day, and they crossed that ocean so wide from New York to Fernandina Bay. They skidded on that ocean tide. They were off to America. It was a land so far away, worth all of the money that they would have to pay just to find Sarasota Bay. Now 
Now when they got the cedar key, things weren't they supposed to be. Nothing had been done. No houses, no schools, no churches, no streets. A wilderness was all that they found. Now some could not believe their eyes. And they left that very day. But some stayed on and they rolled up their sleeves and made a home here by the bay. From the sand, they built homes. And hand in hand, they built a town. From that town, Sarasota was born. It's a place that we are so proud. And they come to America from their lands so far away, worth all of the money that they would have to pay just to find Sarasota Bay, just to find Sarasota Bay. So, let's see. Um, oh, yes, I want to tell you a story about this one guy. How many people have been up to the Gamble Mansion? Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the Civil War, at the end of the Civil War, um, Richmond had fallen. And at the fall of Richmond, the cabinet splintered. They ran for cover. They ran for places to hide out. So Jefferson Davis finally reigns around to this fellow right here. His name is Judah P. Benjamin. He was the Secretary of State of the Southern Confederacy. So they ran up and they ran into each other in Georgia. And he says, uh, Judah, what we're going to do is we're going to call now from here on out, since we have no cities to defend, we are going to have wage a guerrilla war. And we will win this war. We will, our cause is just and we will persevere on. And Judah said, right. And Jefferson Davis said, I'll see you in Mississippi. And he turned and left. And Judah says, right, sure thing. <laughs> no way, man. So he had to come up with a plan. Judah could speak full, fluent French. So he figured that if he made it to Bemini, which was a French province, he'd be able to catch a, a, some sort of a, a ship to England home free, right? Well, there's, a, there's one little problem. There's a, uh, there's a blockade around Florida. And there's all these, all these military ships. And nothing can get in and get out. So he makes his way down to the, uh, down to the Gamble Mansion. Now, the, uh, the guy in the Gamble Mansion, he thinks it's kind of, fun, kind of weird that this guy would stand on the balcony with his, with his little uh, spyglass looking for something. And what he's looking for is the, are the federal, uh, federal patrols. He doesn't want to get caught, you know? So what he does is he makes his way down to, uh, down to Sarasota Bay. And in Sarasota Bay, he runs into a fellow named Captain Trishka. Captain Trishka is Bill Whitaker's son-in-law, okay? And who was also a smuggler. And at the time, what they did with the, with the boats is they would sink the boats, and if they needed to run some stuff, they would bring it up. And then they would move the boats out, and then they would come back in, and they would sink them again to make sure they didn't get caught by the Federals. So, um, now what was kind of weird, what I think was kind of interesting, was that when, he, when Trishka raised the boat and they, and they left, for 23 days they were on that boat. It was Judah Benjamin, Captain Trishka, and a freed slave. So you can imagine the conversations that went down. <laughs> These boys didn't have, no, they didn't have no iPods or nothing to play with, you know? And it was a very small boat, if you can catch what I'm saying. Judah Benjamin was the Secretary of State in the Southern Confederacy. When the cause it was no more, Judah ran away to the sea, brave boys. Judah ran away to the sea. Farewell to Jeff Davis, farewell to Bobby Lee. Farewell to the stars and the bars, brave boys, I'm off to Bemani. 
I'm off to Bemani. He made his way to the Gambo Mansion up near Manatee. He hopped on a horse and he rode to the Gulf and he waited by the sea, brave boys. And he waited by the sea. Farewell to old Jeff Davis. Farewell to Bobby Lee. Farewell to the stars and the bars, brave boys. I'm off to Bemani. I'm off to Bemani. And there he stood upon the shore, met Captain Triska there. Caught away on a smuggler's boat, made away without his care, brave boys. Made away without a care. Farewell, old Jeff Davis. Farewell to Bobby Lee. Farewell to the stars and the bars, brave boys. I'm off to Bemhoney. I'm off to Bemhoney. For 23 days and 23 nights, made it through that old blockade. And there upon a sunny day, they made it to Bemhoney Bay, brave boys. They made it to Bemini Bay. Farewell to old Jeff Davis. Farewell to Bobby Lee. Farewell to the stars and the bars, brave boys. I'm off to Bemini. I'm off to Bemini. And this is the story of Judah, of the Southern Confederacy, with the help of a few brave men. He bravely ran away. He bravely ran away. Farewell to Jeff Davis. Farewell to Bobby Lee. Farewell to the stars and the bars, brave boys. I'm off to Bemhoney. I'm off to Bemhoney. Say uh, he spent the rest of his days out there and never made it back to the U.S. Oh boy! Now, after the Civil War, this place, Sarasota, and and, and places further south, the place was a mess because we were the breadbasket of the Confederacy. We were the ones that fed everyone. And uh, with a, you know, uh, we were we were part of the engine, and uh, it didn't always work that way. A barrel of flour went from five dollars to 125. You know, uh, they would stay with uh, uh, um, up in the northern states. They would uh, get clothes drives, and they would send them down here, and the plantation owners would would take the clothes away before they even hit some of the people. So. When he made it down here in 1868, he was a circuit rider, a Methodist preacher. And he'd fought in some of the, uh, some of the uh, first, second, first Seminole War, Second Seminole War. And um, he was, uh, so he, he came down here with about seven kids. Wound, wound up, uh, before he died, he had nine, and God knows how many grandchildren he had. You know, and I tell you right now, how many people are from Venice? Anybody from Venice? But now people, not a lot of people admit they're from Venice. I understand. <laughs> I understand. Because, because Venice, if you look at it now, if you look at the history, Venice was actually one of the first retirement communities in the entire state. So no one really wants to own up to that too much. Yeah. But the, uh, but uh, if, you go down, if you go south on 41 and you go past Nokomis, there's a bridge right up there. And it's called Shackett Creek. You know what I'm talking about? Shackett Creek. It's called, it's pronounced Shackett Creek. When, uh, when, uh, um, when, when uh, Jesse Knight came down here, uh, if you go, if you look further up, there's a, there's a uh, railroad trestle bridge, and it's very shallow. So that's where they would, the buckboards would, would, would cross. And one particular cold, uh, uh, cold uh, December day, the, uh, they were carrying stuff across the way, and the mules got halfway through, and they didn't want to go any further. And he said, right, and they tried their best. They pushed them. They pulled them. They did everything and tried to entice them with food. They were not going to go anywhere. So uh, Jesse says, says to one of his boys, he says, grab that deer skin and shake it and snap it over their heads like you, like you would a bull whip. And pow, he shot that thing off. The buckboard and the mules just take off, emptying everything they had right into the water. <laughs> and from here on out, it's been called Shake It Creek. 
you came up the coast during the 18, 17, 1800s, there was, it was nothing but pine trees. And there was, over the, over the erosion of wind and storms, there was a, a formation of uh, pine trees that had been boned down and, turned, and looked like a horse and a chase, or horse and a shay, or horse and a buggy. And this is what the place was called, was horse and chase. And that was the name. As a matter of fact, that's how it, that's how it showed up on the, on the maps. Now, I like, to say when, I like to say when I write this song, the main, I had the song completely written. And I had to come up with a chorus. I could not come up with a chorus. And I was sitting, if, you've, if, you've, if you're like me, I love the sunsets here. Are they breathtaking or not? They're amazing. And I was down there trying to come up with some sort of inspiration. And it just so happens that that was the night they were having like a multi-denominational um, um, baptism in the water. I mean, there was uh, six churches, no waiting. You, you just picked a slot and just pushed forward, man. And you, know, and you, you were there. And, I, and from where I was sitting, there was a bunch of people behind me, you know. And, and I'm looking at the sunset and I'm watching the people and I said, and they're trying to figure out, you know, what I'm going to do. And the lady behind me says, let us go down to the ocean to wash our sins away. And I said, now there's a line for you. <laughs> it was 1868. Civil War was over. Some of the boys came home defeated but alive. But to start again, we needed faith in each other. And together we could mend these broken lives. Jesse Knight, he moved his family down the coast. He stopped at a place called Horse and Shade. And he read from the scriptures and he praised the Lord. He built a home where his children would play. And they went down to the ocean went down to the bay and let that water wash their sins away and here they build a home it was a place for all to come here in this place this place called horse and chase Soon others came and they built their lives. They raised their families along this peaceful shore. Seeds were sown beneath the pines, they built their homes. And it all grew right before their eyes. And they went down to the ocean. They went down to the bay and let that water wash their sins away. And here they built a home. It was a place for all to come. Here in this place, this place called Horse and Chase. But fortunes were made and lost, and everyone knew the cost. It was all a roll of the dice. The growing pains were felt by all. But many a dream did fall. That's the price you pay for paradise. And they went down to the ocean. They went down to the bay. 
Let that water wash their sins away And here they built a home It was a place for all to come Here in this place This place called Horse and Chase And they went down to the ocean They went down to the bay Let that water wash their sins away and here they built a home it was a place for all to come here in this place this place called horse and chase here in this place this place called horse and chase Well, if you, uh, uh, about, it's kind of hard to tell, but how many people fish? They go out, there you go. I mean, I'm not talking about in the stream, I'm talking about going out in the Gulf, you know. If you come in, if you come into the Venice Inlet, uh, this would be the, um, the uh, North Inlet, where the fish camp is. You know what I'm talking about? If you come straight in, there's an island right in front of you. That island is called Snake Island. But it's usually called Beer Can Island when I was a kid. <laughs> For obvious reasons. Because you can actually basically walk out there with a, with a whole cooler full of beer and you can hang out there all day long, you know? But um, if you look to your left, there's a place called Casey Key. And Casey Key was named after a fellow by the name of Captain John Casey. And Captain John Casey. Uh, was a veteran of the Mexican, uh, Mexican-American War, the, uh, the Texas Independence War, if you should call it. And um, he, um, he had, he had con contacted, uh, contracted uh, tuberculosis, so he came here to get well. And he went to Fort Brook, which is Tampa. And he, when he got, we got better, he mapped from Fort Brook down to Fort Myers. And in, in doing so, he got to know the Native Americans quite well. And they liked him because he never lied. He was an honest man, a very honest man. And honest men were very hard to come by those days. Because the, cause the, cause the, the Native Americans would, would, uh, would, would do their best, or, or the Seminole and Seminole, they would do their best to try to make, make amends with the white man, and, and they would always break their promises. But um, uh, single-handedly, him and a bunch of other people brought it into the uh, Third Seminole War. So this is a song, it's called uh, An Honest Man. It was a time of unrest And everyone did their best To live their lives and do what was right But the whites pushed further south Driving the Seminole house was a matter of time until they'd stopped the fight. Captain Casey was carried ashore with his body torn. Tuberculosis was the disease. But he fought through it all and he answered the nation's call. To the Seminole he was a friend indeed. Well, he was an honest man living in a troubled land. Everyone knew his word was his bond. A good man is hard to find. Casey never told a lie. With this song, his story lives on. Billy Bowlegs had had enough He attacked the homes on the Gulf Trying to drive the white man away Casey and some men Well, they talked old Billy in Then Sarasota could breathe again Well, he was an honest man Living in a troubled land Everyone knew his word was his 
upon me. A good man is hard to find. Casey never told a lie. With this song, his story lives on. Casey's orders were plain, moved the Seminole West. Sadly, he did what he was told. And on the 4th of May, well, the gray clouds sailed away with Chief Billy Bowlegs aboard. Well, he was an honest man living in a troubled land. Everyone knew his word was his bond. A good man is hard to find. Casey never told a lie. With this song, his story lives on. Now it was on a Christmas day in 1856. Casey's life slipped away and all that he'd done was lost to the sands of time with only a key to bear his name well, he was an honest man living in a troubled land and everyone knew his word was his bond a good man is hard to find Casey never told a lie With this song his story lives on With this song his story lives on With this song Casey lives on It's kind of interesting. You saw some people in there that was, uh, you may have, may not have noticed. It was a fellow by the name of Billy Bowlegs, who was actually a, min uh, a, a minor, or minor celebrity in this area. He would show up. Uh, at the time, uh, there was sort of Sarasota, then there was Bee Ridge, and then there was Fruitville. It was three different places. And uh, Billy Bowlegs had a tendency to dress up in his finest tunic and just kind of jump out of the jump out of the, the brush at people, you know, hi, I'm Billy Bowlegs, and you're damn glad to meet me, you know? And he would expect people to take him into his house and feed him, you know? He was, he was, a, he was a character and a half, I tell you. That guy, I got another song and another 20 stories about that guy. But, but um, the, um, here in, in, um, in Sarasota, around the 1850s, there were these rancheros right out here on the bay. These rancheros were people from Cuba, and they were Spanish-speaking, and they had, uh, they had slaves. And uh, when you had slaves, you had the slaves that did the work, and then you would want one slave to kind of overlook, oversee everybody else. So that guy got a little bit more food or whatever. And, but this one fellow right here, his name is Luis Pachero. And Luis Pichero was one of the slaves here and one of the rancher, ran, rancheros here on the Sarasota Bay. He could, he could uh, read and write. He could speak uh, all the Seminole dialects. He could, speak, uh, he could speak French, speak Spanish, speak English. He was, and he had the trade of being a carpenter, which was really, 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 really rare. Actually sending, you know, giving someone that, that way. Captain Casey was up in Fort Brooke, and when uh, Major Dade was going to take a, go up to Fort King, which is Ocala, he needed an interpreter. 
So he knew there was just the guy. So he sent for Luis. And Luis makes his way up. But by the time he gets up, Major Day has already left. He's, he's taken off towards Fort King because he wanted to try to get up there at least around Christmas time. Now, if you, and during those days, if you left, you left like uh, you had your main column. Then you had your flankers, your forward guard, and your rear guard. And he got up near Fort King, and he felt pretty safe, so he brought in his flankers. The flankers were to chase anyone if they were going, planning to attack you. This was all a coordinated attack with, uh, between uh, Alligator and Mikanobi and uh, uh, Osceola, who at the very same time was killing, uh, his, his, uh, killing a fellow by the name of Wiley Thompson. So it's kind of funny. They said within the first 30 seconds, first couple of minutes of this attack half the command was dead and this is uh, exactly as I read it on the books as someone had been there I want to tell you a story it's sad but it's true it happened when Florida was so fresh and new. Major Dade, he marched north with over a hundred men. And when the shooting was done, only three came home again. Say, where are you going, Major Dade? Where were you riding to on that fateful day? One hundred souls did follow you to an early grave And only three would tell the tale of Major Day Now Major Francis Dade was a prudent, cautious man Sent out his scouts to scour the land he, Keeping his men safe from those Seminole bands When the first shots came only three came home again. And it was two days after Christmas, and northward they did march, and they saw no need for flankers or an advance guard. Micanobi and Alligator waited in the grass so tall, and when the first shots came, half the command did fall. Say, where are you going, Major Day? Where were you riding to on that fateful day? One hundred souls did follow you to an early grave. Only three would tell the tale of Major Day. Now the men, they fought so bravely and they did what they could. And they fired the cannon at the Seminole in the woods. Some gathered ammunition, others they felled trees. Most of the men lay dead or dying in the weeds. Now after the first attack, scarcely few were left alive. Seminole took the weapons and they left the rest to die. Soon 40 black Seminole rode up with axes and knives and they massacred the wounded despite their mournful cries. Say, where are you going, Major Day? Where were you riding to on that fateful day? One hundred souls did follow you to an early grave. Only three would tell the tale of Major Day. Troopers Clark, Thomas, and Sprague, they slipped away after dark. And the hell they lived through had left their mark. Crawling to Fort Brook, more dead than alive. There they told the tales of the ones they left behind. Say, where are you going, Major Day? Where were you riding to on that fateful day? One hundred souls did follow you to an early grave. Only three would tell the tale of Major Day. Yeah, now only three would tell the tale of Major Day. Yeah, now only three would tell the tale of Major Day.
Yeah, yeah. So, um, let me read you. I'm going to tell you a story about a lady who was a fascinating lady. See, see some, some folks are saying, you're going to talk about women? Yes, I am. I'm going to talk about women. I'm going to talk about an amazing woman. Her name was uh, Bertha Palmer. Yeah, you guys have been out to the Spanish Point? Yeah. Out there, Bertha Palmer was an amazing lady. Amazing lady because she had money and she did not care. She spread that money around. She fought for, for the under, underprivileged. She fought for people in poverty. She fought for women's education. She fought and she had money and she didn't let the money hold her back. She spent it freely and she did what was needed to be done. To me, that's a damn good quality in a person. I don't know about you, but that was amazing. She came down here, and if it wasn't for her, her uh, pushing this place, uh, maybe some of it would have been a lot slower. She's one that brought the spur of the railroad down. And uh, you know where Mayaka State Park is? You guys know what I'm talking about? There's a fellow by the name of Dink Murphy. He had owned all that land. He had all this cattle. And uh, Bertha came down here, and she decided... She decided she wanted to get into the cattle business. Well, the fellows who had been here had been doing this stuff for 20, 30 years thought, woman, cattle business, where are you out of your mind? She didn't know what she's doing. But she had one thing on her side. She had people who had information and, and research, and they found out that if you dipped your cattle into a, a certain solution, it killed the ticks and the fleas, which actually allowed the cows to go bigger. And, 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 uh, and live longer, you know. She put up fences. All this while I've talked about, like, when, they, when uh, uh, Jesse Palmer or Jesse, uh, uh, Jesse Knight came down, the cattle ran free. You just branded them and said, oh, that's Bob's cow. I better take it back to Bob, you know. <laughs> but this, she put up fences. Like, this is mine. This is yours. You keep your stuff over here. This is mine. Thank you very much. And they didn't like that too well. You know, they thought, who is this woman? Who does she think she is? But they had no idea she had, who she had worked with, who she had fought for. But they figured that out. They figured that out after a while, you know. Bertha Palmer was strong and kind A real revolutionary long before her time She lived a life of style and grace She left this coast a better place Bertha Palmer was strong and kind Not afraid to speak her mind Looked to the future and she worked for change she left this coast a better place. Bertha Palmer, Chicago socialite, worked for Susan B. and she worked for women's rights. She worked for the impoverished, and I'd like to note, she did all this before women had a vote. Bertha Palmer was strong and kind. Not afraid to speak her mind. Look to the future and she worked for change. She left this coast a better place. Where well, she bought up land in 1910. Went to Sarasota to Venice and then chose Osprey Point for her winter estate. Woman in a man's world, now she just couldn't wait. Well, she bought Murphy's cattle. She was downright suspicious, no, downright ambitious. The ranchers didn't like it, they were downright suspicious. She built fences, dipped her cows in a vat. Killing ticks and fleas, but they liked her after that. Bertha Palmer was strong and kind. Not afraid to speak her mind. Look to the future and she worked for change. 
She left this coast a better place. Once Sarasota, she left her mark. Spanish Point, Mayaka River State Park. Work for education, equal rights for equal pay. A woman in a man's world making her own way. Bertha Palmer was strong and kind. Not afraid to speak her mind. Look to the future and she worked for change. She left this coast a better place. Bertha Palmer was strong and kind. Real revolutionary long before her time. She lived a life of style and grace. She left this coast a better place. Yeah, she left this coast a better place. And we thank her for that. Well, folks, um, there's so many things I didn't get a chance to touch on, you know? Um, there's, there's, there was the murders that happened down here, in here by uh, Al Bidwell. I don't know if you know about that, but there was uh, the uh, attacks and the, uh, during the uh, lands, big land swindle. The, uh, they, they, um, they, they say his, his ghost is still seen down on, down on the bay. Uh, there was a fellow by the name of uh, Stetson Kennedy. Does anyone know who Stetson Kennedy is? Stetson Kennedy was a man who had guts. This man had guts. He went out and joins the Klan, finds out how the Klans work. Then he took what, the information he was getting, turned around, turned, gave it to the FBI. And then, on top of that, he, gets, he, he goes and he writes a script for a, a radio show called Superman. And he exposes the clan for exactly who they are. And after that, they tried to kill him for the next 15 years. And eventually they gave up. Now, that kind of a hero, you just, you just can't get rid of. And you don't want to. It's an amazing guy. Right here below your feet, ladies and gentlemen, is history. It's in the sand, it's in the air, it's in the, it's in the breezes that blow through the pine trees. They whisper names of people. And all you have to do is do what I did, is to go into the nearest library and check things out. Not that far, not that hard, it's real easy. One of the fellows that came down and spent some time with Stetson was a young man by the name of Woodrow Wilson Guthrie. He stayed at his place in what they call Baluthahatchee. I think you might know this song. This land is your land, this land is my land From the California to the New York Island From the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters This land was made for you and me As I was out walking that ribbon of highway I saw above me that in the skyway I saw below me that golden valley this land was made for you and me this land is your land this land is my land from the California to the New York Island from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters this land was made for you and me. Let's get the band in here. Now the sun was shining 
power strolling, we fields waving, and the dust clouds rolling. I could see inside me and see you around me. This land was made for you and me. This land is your land. This, this land, land is my land. From California to the New York Island. From the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters. This land was made. There's a couple of verses that actually got left out from the original publication. And this man next to me knows those verses. He was there when they first came out. <laughs> By the shadow of the steeple, I've seen my people. By the relief office, I've seen my people. And some were hungry and some This land is my land, from California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream water. This land was made for you and me. Nobody living can ever stop me as I go walking that freedom highway. This land is your land, this land is my land, from the California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream water, this land was made for you and me. Come on everybody now. This land is your land, this land is my land. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to me. And get ready for Bill Schuster. <laughs>